This is Space Time Series 27, Episode 102, for broadcast on the 23rd of August, 2024. Coming up on Space Time, farewell to NASA's Neowise Space Telescope, why it's so difficult to tell the time on the moon, and Europe's space rider spacecraft successfully completes its drop tests. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. NASA's Neowise Infrared Space Telescope has relayed its final data stream to Earth, bringing its historic mission to an end. Mission managers at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, then sent a final command to the orbiting spacecraft, instructing it to turn its transmitter off. This concluded more than 10 years of planetary defence by NEOWISE, the Near-Earth Object Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer mission, which searched the heavens for asteroids, meteors and comets, including those that could pose a threat to planet Earth. NASA Associate Administrator Nicola Fox described NEOWISE's mission as an extraordinary success story to help science better understand our place in the universe by tracking asteroids and comets that could be hazardous for us on Earth. NASA ended the mission because Neowise is about to drop too low into Earth's orbit to provide stable and usable science data. The problem is the recent uptick in solar activity is heating the upper atmosphere of our planet, causing it to expand. That creates additional orbital drag on spacecraft, and as Neowise doesn't have a propulsion system to keep it in orbit, that drag causes orbital decay. Based on its current rate of descent, Neowise is expected to safely burn up in Earth's atmosphere later this year. During its operational lifetime, the Infrared Survey Telescopes exceeded all scientific objectives, not for just one mission, but two, starting with the original WISE Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer mission. Managed by JPL, WISE launched in December 2009 with a seven-month mission to scan the entire infrared sky. By July 2010, WISE had accomplished this with far greater sensitivity than any previous survey. And just a few months later, the telescope ran out of the cryogenic coolant that kept heat produced by the spacecraft's instruments from interfering with its infrared observations. NASA then extended the mission under the new name NEOWISE until February 2011 to complete a survey of main belt asteroids between Mars and Jupiter, after which the spacecraft was put into hibernation. But an analysis of this data showed that although the lack of coolant meant the spacecraft could no longer observe the faintest infrared objects in the universe, it could still make precise observations of asteroids and comets which are generating a strong enough infrared signal after being heated by the sun as they travelled past the Earth. So, NASA decided to bring the telescope back out of hibernation in 2013 under the Near-Earth Objects Observation Program. Over its extended operational lifetime, NEOWISE has been instrumental in science's quest to map the skies and understand the near-Earth environment. Its huge number of discoveries have expanded science's knowledge of asteroids and comets while also boosting planetary defence. By repeatedly observing the sky from low Earth orbit, NEOWISE created all-sky maps featuring 1.45 million infrared measurements of more than 44,000 solar system objects. Of the 3,000-plus near-Earth objects it detected, 215 were first spotted by NEOWISE. The mission also discovered 25 new comets, including the famed Comet C-2020F3 NEOWISE that streaked across the night skies of planet Earth in the summer of 2020. In addition to leaving behind a treasure trove of science data, the spacecraft has helped inform the development of NASA's first infrared space telescope, purpose-built for detecting near-Earth objects, to be known as NEOSurveyor. Principal investigator for both NEOWISE and NEOSurveyor, Amy Mainzer from the University of California, says the NEOWISE mission provided a unique long-duration data set of the infrared sky, and that will be used by scientists for decades to come. And it also helped lay the groundwork for NEOSurveyor, which will seek out some of the hardest-to-find near-Earth objects, such as dark asteroids and comets that don't reflect much visible light, as well as objects which approach the Earth from the direction of the sun's glare, which makes them hard to see. Construction of Neo Surveyor is already well underway, with a launch date set for no earlier than 2027. This report from NASA TV. Neowise is coming at long last to an end. 
If you're really lucky, your spacecraft will last far longer than you designed it for. In our case, we are many years now into a six-month mission. <laughs> so we've been really lucky. The NEOWISE mission began with the WISE mission. WISE was a mission, the Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer, to study the astrophysical sky, to look for the brightest galaxies in the universe and the closest and coldest stars in our local solar neighborhood. And along the way, we happened to be good at seeing asteroids and comets. So after the original WISE mission shut down, it was put into hibernation at the beginning of 2011. And then in late 2013, we woke it up. And lo and behold, it was doing great. And it was ready for a new mission, looking for asteroids and comets, particularly those that come close to Earth, called near-Earth objects. So uh, we renamed the spacecraft NEOWISE in honor of its ability to find and characterize near-Earth objects. We observed over 150,000 objects in the solar system, measuring diameters for all of them, and really helping us expand our database for the physical properties of asteroids and comets. On one hand, it was an exploratory science mission, but on the other hand, there's a really practical purpose to it. We'd really like to know how often the Earth can get hit by asteroids and comets, and this has helped us understand that. There are so many favorite moments with this project. We've seen all kinds of wonderful things. We've been able to do a lot. So the NEOWISE mission right now is coming to the end of its life. We don't have any onboard propulsion, so we can't change the orbit. We can't lift the spacecraft higher away from the Earth. The Earth's atmosphere is gradually dragging the spacecraft in. As NEOWISE falls into thicker and thicker atmosphere, its behavior changes in ways that make it a little bit harder to operate. And so it's best if we put it to sleep before it actually re-enters and burns up. And pretty soon it will enter the atmosphere, which means it's going to turn into the thing we've been looking for all this time. It's gonna become a shooting star, and that'll be the end. Well, even though NEOWISE is ending, there's still going to be a future to tracking near-Earth objects because we still haven't found them all. We're also in the process of building a new space telescope. It's called the Near-Earth Object Surveyor Mission, and its goal is find and characterize the objects that can impact the Earth. NEOWISE has revolutionized our understanding of the solar system. It produced things that help us better understand our place in the universe, that we made an important contribution to humanity's understanding of our place. That's what I'll hold in my heart. NEOWISE, thanks for all the great data and all the great times. As a scientist, we could not have asked for anything more. And in that report from NASA TV, we heard from NEOWISE Principal Investigator Amy Mainzer, NEOWISE Deputy Principal Investigator Joe Massiro, and NEOWISE Lead Operations Engineer Beth Fabian Sky. This is Space Time. Still to come, it turns out asking what time it is on the moon isn't as easy as it sounds. And Europe's Space Rider Project successfully completes its drop tests. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Have you ever wondered what time it is on the moon? Well, it turns out that question is a lot more difficult to answer than you'd think. Scientists are now developing a plan for precise timekeeping both on the lunar surface and in near-lunar space. For decades, the moon's subtle gravitational pull has posed a vexing challenge. Atomic clocks on its surface will tick faster than those on Earth by about 56 microseconds per day. So now researchers at America's National Institute of Standards and Technology have developed a plan for precise timekeeping on the moon, paving the way for a GPS-like navigation system for lunar exploration. The research, published in the Astronomical Journal, focuses on defining theoretical framework and mathematical models necessary for creating a lunar coordinate time system. The work is crucial for NASA's Artemis program, which aims to establish a sustained human presence on the Moon and use that as a stepping stone for eventual manned missions to Mars and beyond. GPS on Earth relies heavily on very precise timekeeping. Every satellite in the GPS constellation carries atomic clocks synchronized to a common time reference. By measuring the time it takes for signals from multiple satellites to reach a receiver, GPS can determine the receiver's exact position and time. However, implementing a similar system on the Moon and relating it accurately to the Earth system presents unique challenges due to the effects of relativity. 
Einstein's relativity theory states that gravity affects the passage of time. It's called time dilation. In other words, time doesn't flow uniformly for everyone. For instance, on the moon, where gravity is a lot weaker than on Earth, clocks will tick slightly faster. In addition, an observer on Earth measures time slightly different to an observer on the moon due to a number of gravity-related effects, including the moon's orbit around the Earth and the Earth's orbit around the Sun. These effects will significantly impact precise navigation and communication over time. To address this issue, scientists have created a system to establish and implement lunar time that accounts for the moon's unique gravitational environment. The system will establish a new master moon time that serves as a timekeeping reference, specifically for the entire lunar surface, similar to how Greenwich Mean Time, that is Coordinated Universal Time or UTC, functions here on Earth. In other words, it's like having the entire moon synchronized to one time zone, adjusted for the moon's gravity, rather than having clocks gradually drift out of sync with the Earth's time. National Institute of Standards physicist Neil Ashby says it lays the foundation for adopting a navigation and timing system similar to GPS, which could serve near-Earth and Earth-bound users for lunar exploration. The proposal would be the first step in the development of a lunar positioning system. That would include a highly precise network of clocks at specific locations on the Moon's surface and in lunar orbit. These precise atomic clocks in lunar orbit would function as the satellites of the lunar GPS network, providing accurate timing signals for navigation. Precise navigation positioning on the Moon would lead to more accurate landings and more efficient exploration for lunar resources. See, without a lunar GPS, landing and operating on the Moon would be like trying to navigate on Earth without a global positioning system. You'd only have a rough idea of your location, making it extremely difficult to carry out complex operations or travel long distances accurately. This is Space Time. Over the last four months, the European Space Agency's new reusable space rider test article has been undertaking a series of drop tests in the skies above the Italian island of Sardinia. The tests, using a full-scale model of the wedge-shaped lifting body design, were aimed to validate the deployment of the spacecraft's parachutes. The space rider spacecraft is about the size of a couple of SUVs. It consists of two segments, an orbital module providing essential in-flight support and a re-entry module that carries out in-orbit experiments and returns those experiments to the ground. ESA scientists and engineers have been undertaking weight distribution tests, monitoring how the actual 3,000-kilogram re-entry vehicle is likely to behave during regular operations. The tests have been looking at evaluating the parachutes, the parafoil and the various control winches that will ensure an automated soft landing. Dropped from an altitude of around 3.5 kilometres, sets of drogue chutes are first deployed. That decelerates the test article to an appropriate speed for the extraction of the parafoil. The 27 by 10 metre parafoil is remotely controlled by ground crew to test its aerodynamic performance. When all goes well, the vehicle lands safely and gently, descending at a rate of just 12 kilometres per hour. In a few months' time, further tests will evaluate the flight control algorithm that's designed to autonomously guide the spacecraft to a designated landing point. These tests will eventually certify the entire mission profile from orbital flight deployment to Earth EDL, entry, descent and landing. Following the completion of these test campaigns, ESA will then commence manufacturing actual flight models. Needless to say, we'll keep you informed. This is Space Time. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. A new study has shown that droughts, heat waves, fires and fertilisers can all stress our soils, causing them to store less carbon. The findings, reported in the journal Nature Climate Change, suggest that the more stresses soils are exposed to, the less carbon they can store. The research found that soil carbon stocks in harsher climate conditions, such as those across much of Australia, may be highly vulnerable to these stresses and may therefore be more likely to rapidly lose stored carbon back into the atmosphere, which would then impact climate change. 
A new study has found a link between heavy cannabis use and an increased risk of head and neck cancers. A report in the Journal of the American Medical Association looked at data for more than 4 million people, 116,076 of whom had a diagnosed cannabis-related disorder defined as excessive use of the drug leading to social problems or struggles to hold down a job. They found that heavy cannabis users had an increased risk of all types of head and neck cancers, as well as oral, nasal, salivary gland and larynx cancers, compared to a group of similar people who were non-cannabis users. However, this type of study can't prove that cannabis is actually causing an increased cancer risk, just that there's a link. And the authors say heavy tobacco and alcohol use among cannabis users may also have influenced the results. But as cannabis becomes more acceptable in many parts of the world, the authors are stressing the need to investigate the links more thoroughly. As with all computer programs, new researchers confirm that when it comes to artificial intelligence, it's still a case of garbage in, garbage out. Meaning if you employ trashy programmers, you'll wind up with trashy AI. Now, scientists have investigated the political biases of -of state-of-the-art AI chatbots and shown that fine-tuning can influence their political preferences. A report in the journal PLOS One has examined a study in which 11 political tests were used on 24 conversational chatbots, including OpenAI's ChatGPT4 and Twitter's Gronk, mostly returning leftist results. They found that using targeted political material to fine-tune large language models, the authors were able to create chatbots whose responses consistently returned right, left or centralist scores. Time now for what must be our silliest story of the week. And it seems paranormal practitioners are now claiming a portal has opened up in the spooky forest in Staffordshire, allowing werewolves and other supernatural entities to enter our world. Reports of a creepy black-eyed child haunting the woods first began circulating in the 1980s. Some believe it's the spirit of a murdered girl, while others think it could be a demon or alien entity. Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptic says true believers are claiming the woods are haunted with numerous spirits of the dead, including werewolves, ghosts, demons and monsters. Apparently in Cannock Chase, which is a quote, spooky English forest in Staffordshire, there's a portal. And this portal is responsible for possibly allowing werewolves, giant beasts, ghosts, and the infamous black-eyed child to enter our world. What's the difference between a werewolf and a wolf, man? Yeah, I wonder that too. Are werewolves always wolves, or are they um, nasty wolves, or are they transformed human beings? Probably not a lot. Someone will actually let me know now. You know, someone will... I wish they would tell you the difference between... I've seen images of old etchings and things of werewolves leaning up against the wall, almost like they're having cigarettes, (laughs) waiting for the transformation. Wolf men tend to be individual. Well, there's a long history of dogs and wolves. You've got to understand this. (laughs) Yes, yes. Uh, but yeah, Wolf went. Anyway, this portal is supposed to be there. And lo and behold, this person who's promoting this has a new book out called Werewolves and Dogmen in the UK. And he also believes it is entirely possible that something exceptionally big is coming. Doesn't say what. Is it a giant wolf? Is it a giant black eyed child? Is it a giant phantom hitchhiker? What is it? Claim after claim after claim after claim. Other people are saying there's actually portals within London in certain areas. Portals is a nice thing, little circle that opens up. It's called the tube, uh, isn't it? <laughs> Uh, yes. Is it true? No. <laughs> Are people claiming it? Uh, yeah. Uh, will we find out? Probably not, but it'll be interesting to see how it develops. That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. And that's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider, and from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Space Time store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Space Time patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. 
This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 